The scriptures tell us of the importance of studying God's Word. The psalmist writes, Thy word is a lamp unto thy feet, and a light unto thy path. In another place, he continues, How can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to thy word. We at Calvary Chapel Worship Center believe in teaching through the Bible in its entirety. May your faith be increased at the hearing of God's word. Here now is Pastor Rich. To Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. As we are continuing our study through the ba uh, book of Matthew on the weekend services, and remember, uh, during the Wednesday services right now, we are stu studying through First and Second Chronicles, verse by verse. But the title of the message this morning is Building on the Rock. Let's ask the Lord's blessing. Father, we are so thankful as we look to your word. We know that we receive a tremendous blessing because your word is a lamp to our feet. Lord, you show us the way in which we should live. And so, Lord, we come with a, a desire to change our lives and to be transformed by the moving of your Holy Spirit in our lives. We come with that desire this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. We are continuing through a study of the longest sermon, the most famous sermon that Jesus gave called the Sermon on the Mount. Very early in his ministry, he settled in Capernaum, a small town at the north end of the Sea of Galilee. And uh, he uh, went up to the mountain that's behind that uh, town, and a large, large crowd gathered to him to hear what he had to say. Very early in his ministry. And he sat down and he began to teach them this, this, this wonderful message. And it was absolutely life-changing, shocking in many ways. They had never heard anything like this before. What they had been taught by the Jewish leaders of the day was it was about religious outward conformity to a law. Jesus came and spoke to them about their heart. He came and talked to them about transforming their lives, and he began the message by speaking of what we call the Beatitudes, the attitude of the heart. Blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed of God, favored of God are you. When you have that heart, that humility, the joy of the Lord is yours. Blessed. Blessed are. And he began to speak of their heart. And he continued this great message with wonderful insights for them. He talked to them about the kingdom of heaven making a great difference in the world. Uh, I'm going to send you out as salt. They need, this world needs salt. It needs light. And you're the light that's like a city set on the hill, you're the light of the world. Go, make a difference. They will see your heart. They'll see your life. And they're going to glorify your Father who is in heaven. And he began to just speak to them then about their relationship to the stuff of the world. I mean, he was touching on so many powerful things they need, we need. And, and, and he was speaking about their relationship to stuff. You know, the mammon, the stuff of the world. That was even more applicable to us than it was to them, because we got stuff. And then he spoke to them about worry and anxiety and fear. Don't have anxiety in your life or worry or fear. O ye of little faith, strengthen. You know, he's strengthening their faith to trust in the Lord more. And uh, he spoke to them about not looking down upon others with a condemning or critical spirit, but having the grace of the Lord towards others. And then he spoke to them about their relationship to God, the life that's changed. What kind of a relationship does the transformed life have to their God? And so he began to speak to them about that. And, and, and he finished, and that's where we're going to look today as well, that you listen to the words of the Lord, he said, and you build your life upon those words, and you built your life upon a rock. For times of trouble will come. Storms will come, the rains will, will, will bear down, floods will rise, but that house will stand, your life will stand. You will be prepared for troubles when you build your life upon the words of life, the words of the Lord. And that's a great word for all of us because we live in troubled times. And in fact, getting more troubled, greater tribulation still is yet coming. And so that's a great word for us to understand. Build your life. On those words, and you have built your life on a rock. And so we look now at Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. He begins here 
by talking about prayer. Now, this is interesting because it's the third time in this one sermon he has spoken of prayer. That's how important prayer is to the life of the believer. This is God speaking to his people. Third time he mentioned prayer. Remember what he said the first time. He spoke to them and, and uh, he said, Now, don't be like the hypocrites. He, he held nothing back. Don't be like the hypocrites who love to give long prayers in order to be noticed, in order to be seen by men. And he said, God hears you in secret. Don't, don't, don't give a, a, a meaningless repetition in your prayers. It's meaningless. Don't be like the Gentiles who do this, he said. Intimate, sincere, genuine prayer. Then he spoke to them and he said, when you pray, pray this way. Our Father, now that right there was, was revolutionary. Our Father who is in heaven, your name is holy. Hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Giving them an example of prayer. Then when we come to Matthew chapter 7, verse 7, he gives a great encouragement to their faith in prayer. The effectiveness of prayer. See, prayer is an absolutely essential part of our relationship to the Lord. But we need, and these words are so encouraging to our faith in our relationship to the Lord. Notice what he says, because he begins with three amazing words, ask. He's telling us, ask, seek, knock. And so that's how he begins. Notice verse 7, ask, and it will be given unto you. Seek, and you will find. There's an encouragement. Seek, knock, and a door will be opened unto you. For everyone who asks, receives. And he who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. Isn't that, isn't that encouraging? This is the Lord, God, through Jesus, is speaking to us about the importance of prayer and the, and the heart of God in prayer. This is great. One of the things that we got to see, though, is that, and this helps uh, for us to understand it in the original Greek, and that is keep on asking. Keep on seeking. Keep on knocking. There's a persistence in it. But also one of the things that we need to see is that God is the one saying, hey, I want you to ask. I want you to ask. I want you to seek. I want you to knock. And some people uh, have asked, and I think it's a, it's a reasonable question, some people have asked, well, if God already knows what we need, why should we ask? I mean, isn't that true? God already knows. He, he knows all things. Does he not already know what we need? So if he already knows what we need, why do we, why do we have to ask? And the answer, God wants you to ask. You see, we need to ask. We need to keep asking. We need to seek. We need to not. We need it. Notice interesting here, the words ask, seek, and knock indicate an increasing intensity. Ask, seek, and then knock. There's an intensity in prayer as you draw nearer and nearer. You know, what's interesting is that you see those same words, ask, seek, and knock, in regards to God's relationship to us. Ask, does God ask? Yes. We looked at this last week. One of the most famous, and I think absolutely Powerful verses of the New Testament. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20. Amazing verse. 2 Corinthians 5, 20 says, Therefore we are ambassadors for Christ. We represent him right to the world. Then he says, As though God were making an appeal. God were asking. God even asked with entreaty. Therefore we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. That's amazing. God says to people, please. Don't you find that amazing? I mean, God sits on the throne of maker of heaven and earth, spoke of all things into existence. All you got to do is go outside at night, look at the stars, and you are amazed. And then you realize he spoke those things into existence. How great is our God? How awesome is the Lord? And yet he asks, he says, please, be reconciled to God. You know why he asks? Because God so loved the world. God so loved the world 
that he sent his only son, that whosoever should believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. What's the point? The point is he doesn't want us to go down the road of death, doesn't want us to go into destruction. Don't perish. Please hear this. I sent my son for you. Please, I'm asking you. I think that's amazing. Now, what's interesting? He uses the word seek in regards to us as well. Notice in Luke chapter 19, verse 10, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save. So in his relationship to us, he says, I'm seeking. I am longing and seeking for those who would be saved. Now, what's interesting also is he uses the word knock in his relationship to us. This is from, found in Revelation 3.20. Behold... Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock. Now, I find that amazing. God comes to your heart and he knocks. Don't you think that's interesting? I mean, you, you know, you can just imagine. God, creator of heaven and of, of earth, you'd think he would sit there on his throne and say, now you come to me when you think you, get, when you, think you can arise to it. You come. To, no. God, I'm knocking on your door. I'm asking you to open the door of your life. I think it's amazing. He stands at the door and knocks. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come in to him and will dine with him and he with me. Now, when you look at Matthew 7, when it says, keep on asking, keep seeking, keep knocking, it suggests that we need more faith in trusting the Lord's timing for his answer. Now, we don't do very good on this one. You've got to admit with me, we don't do good when it comes to waiting for the Lord. I mean, we're just a little bit too much on the impatient side of things. You know why that is? We live in a culture. Our society, our culture, it breathes and rewards efficiency. You know, if you're efficient, you know, we want to be able to do something right now. And we get so impatient if things don't happen right now. Do you know what I'm saying? You drive, up to, <laughs> this is, you drive up to a restaurant for dinner. I mean, just imagine that with me, right? You drive up to a restaurant, you go to the drive through and if you're sitting there, you know, there's a couple cars in front of you, you're sitting there in the drive through and the guy is like, what is, what is he ordering? He's, what is taking you so long, pal? What is up with dinner? It's easy. You just order your thing, and well, what are you doing there? Have you ever done this? This, of course, when you're in a hurry. Then you go up, you order yours, you know, you pull up to the window, and they're putting it together, and it seems like it's taking them an extra 30 seconds. What is wrong with these people? And, get, and this is for dinner, which you got in three minutes. Or how about this one? Now, this happens to me sometimes. You're driving down the road, heavy traffic. There are two lanes. You know, it's stop and go. So you, got, you see now, which lane is the faster one? They're barely moving, but you're estimating that which one is the faster one. Oh, it looks like the other one is a little faster. So you get in the other lane, which you think is faster, and as soon as you get into that lane, that's the one that slows down. You know what I'm saying? And then the other one starts to move, so you think, okay, I better get in the other one. So you work your way into the other one, and that's the one that slows down. There's a conspiracy. <laughs> Am I the only one? And the problem is... The problem is, you are driving a car, and, and you're, you know, my son, and we drove clear across the United States in 48 hours. I mean, can you imagine the people in the old days with wagons? You know, I mean, we, we, oh, we want everything right now. I remember when I first got a computer, and it had this Bible software where you could do searches. And we, oh, this is amazing. You know, you can do Bible searches, search the whole Bible, you know. And uh, so I put in this search thing, and it took several minutes. I know I thought, this is a computer. This should, and I remember talking to my professor, saying, hey, I put this search word in. He recommended the software. I got your software, you know, and I put that search word in. It took several minutes to get a result. He laughed. Try doing that by hand there, pal. Oh, well, that's a good point. <laughs> you know, Strong's Concordance, you ever look at Strong's Concordance? Strong's Concordance, one of the famous uh, tools, resource, research tools, took a lifetime, a lifetime invested in Strong's Concordance. And then we get impatient if we don't get something right now. Can you imagine investing your life in one book? 
And oh, we want everything. And so when, when God says keep asking and be persistent but patient in your faith waiting for the Lord, we don't do so good on that one. But that's what we understand from Scripture. To keep asking, to keep knocking is a faith question. Will you trust the Lord's timing? One of the things that we see, and we see it from the context here as well, which we'll read in just a minute, is that we can know from Scripture that when God answers prayer, He answers with that which is good. Therefore, we can conclude that the timing of the Lord is good. We can believe that if God's answer is good, and that's what the Scripture tells us, He gives what is good. Therefore, we can believe that the timing of the Lord is good. And in fact, we can conclude then that He will not give us what is not good. He won't give us what is not good. He knows our motives. He knows our heart. And He knows that which isn't good. Look at James chapter 4, verses 2 and 3. Very important insight in prayer. James 4, 2 and 3 says, You do not have because you do not ask. Right there... That should charge us to understand how important it is to pray. He says, you don't have, well, you don't want to ask. Ask. God is saying, ask. We need to ask. I want you to ask and keep asking. But, he continues, you ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives. God knows our heart. So that, we may, so that you may spend it on your pleasures. So you can ask for that which you think is good. You think it's good, but God weighs the heart. He knows what's good. God will not give to us. Have you ever done this? Have you ever prayed? You, you think you know what's good. You think you know what's right. And you pray, oh God, I need the, I'm asking for this thing. And then God does, he does not answer. He said, no, he doesn't give you the thing. And then sometime later, I don't know, years or whatever later, you look back and you realize, I am so thankful that God did not answer that prayer. Have you ever had that happen to you? I mean, you can trust the timing that he will, even if you ask in persistence, if it's not good, won't do it. Praise God for that. He, in his love for you, does that which is good. And even if you persist in it, the answer is no. I remember walking through this grocery store with Jordy, and uh, we, we came upon this scene unfolding before us. There was this mother and a young child. And the, the, the discussion went this way. Now you put those cookies back. Apparently the kid had grabbed some cookies off the shelf and thrown them in. And so she said, you put those cookies back. And he says, no, I'm not going to do it. And she said, yes, you put those cookies back. And he said, no, yes, you are. You put those cookies back. No, I won't. Now this continued this way. And I'm just going, yes, no, I'm not going to do it. Yes, you are. No, I'm not. Yes, I am. And he just consists. He's very persistent. He's going, to, he's going to stay on this point. No, I'm not going to put those cookies back. I walked past and I whispered to Jordy, the kid will win. I knew. I just could tell it. The mom was going to cave, which isn't good. It isn't good. Aren't you glad God doesn't cave no he knows what is good waiting on the lord means that we wait in faith that even the timing of the lord is good james chapter 1 verse 17 every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above coming down from the father of lights with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow now notice this as we go back to matthew chapter 7 notice in verse 9 for what man is there among you when his son asks for a loaf would give him a stone? Now he's talking about prayer and he makes a, a comparison. And he said, now what man among you if his son asks for bread? Now that's a necessity. If his son asks for bread, what man among you would give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, he will not give him a snake, would he? What is the point? His point is this. Verse 11, if you then, being evil, which means worldly, of the world, if you then, being of the world, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your Father who is in heaven know or give what is good to those who ask Him? Now this is important for us to understand because this is what Jesus is teaching. God takes your prayer seriously. 
I mean, I think some people wonder, does God hear my prayers? And two, does he take them seriously? How seriously does God take my prayers? And this, Scripture helps us to understand. God takes our prayers seriously. Although it's interesting because Jesus is using some humor here. I think this is wonderful. Jesus used so much color, so much humor in his message. Remember last week when he was talking about if there's a speck in your brother's eye, you know, uh, don't try to take the speck that's, out of your brother, uh, that's in your brother's eye when there's a log in your own eye. And of course the people would sit there chuckling. Now that's a picture for you right there. You know, you can just imagine somebody with a log in his eye trying to take the speck into someone else's eye. Oh, that's, a, that's a very colorful picture. And then Jesus gives another colorful one here and he says, now if your son asks for a fish, you think his father would give him a snake? You could just imagine that saying, you know, that's a good idea. Boy, that's, that snake trick works every time. You know, he said, no, Jesus is using a great colorful point to make his, his message so clear. You wouldn't do that. God wouldn't do it either. God takes your prayer seriously. I love what he says because he says, your father, your father in heaven, he's your father. And so you get that picture right away. He takes your prayers seriously. How much more your Father when you pray? See, wait for the Lord with all patience, knowing that He's working good in your life through it. There's some great scriptures. Luke 18, verses 1 and 8. Great scripture. Now, He was telling them the parable to show that at all times they ought to pray and not to lose heart, for God is doing something in their lives. Notice verse 8. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? God is strengthening faith in, in the persistence of prayer. God is strengthening faith. Wait on the Lord. Something good is happening. I love Psalm 127, verse 2, one of my favorite verses. Because it tells us here something very important about the Lord that we really need to understand. And it has everything to do with prayer. Notice in Psalm 127, verse 2, it's vain to rise up early, to retire late, to eat the bread of painful labors, for He gives to His beloved even while He sleeps. I love that. God is at work. You can believe this. God is at work in your life. God is working in your behalf. If God before us, who can be against us? You can trust us. You can know it. God is at work, even when you're sleeping, even when you're not aware of it. It has everything to do with prayer. Trust the Lord. For even if He does not answer the way you think He should, He is working good into your life. I remember reading a book about Alexander Solzhenitsyn, famous Russian author. And if you remember him or had heard about him, you know that he spent many years in Russian prisons, gulag. And, and the oppression, the famine, starvation, the ill treatment, sickness became unbearable. And this went on year after year. He became just emaciated and shrunk down to nothing and his spirit began to die within him. And at a point, he came to this point where he, had done, he was done. He was ready to quit, ready to give it up. So he did. He put down his shovel, and he went down, and he sat down. He said, I quit. Put his shovel down and sat down. Knowing that a guard would see him, would come over and command him to get back to work. And then if he refused, the guard would beat him to death. And he didn't care anymore. And so he sat down, went over there and just sat down and waited. He felt the presence. Then he looked up. There was another old, skinny, emaciated prisoner who sat down next to him, took out a little stick, and he drew a cross in the dirt. The old man got up and left Solzhenitsyn there to stare at that cross. And something began to stir in him. God is over all this. God is over this prison. God is over this nation. God is over all that which is wrong. I will wait. I will wait. He got his faith back. He got encouragement back. He got up. 
took a shovel, I will wait for you. Now we know the end of the story. Because he was miraculously freed. And he went on then to write a series of books which exposed all of that to the world. I will wait for you. I, I love this. This is a wonderful statement of faith. God is working. And if we could trust Him, we would know that He is working in our behalf. For He gives that which is good. That's why Jesus said, You who are worldly, you know how to give that which is good to your children. How much more God? There's a faith in that. There's a trust in that. And that's what we see. Ask. Seek. Knock. God will hear. God takes your prayer seriously. He will answer. We need that. Now, what's interesting is verse 12 seems to jump into a new, new direction, but it doesn't. It's important because there's a therefore in verse 12. Therefore. If these things be so, therefore... Now, interesting, however you want people to treat you, so treat them, for this is the law and the prophets. What is he saying here? He's saying to them that if your relationship to God be transformed, if your relationship to the Lord be changed, it will change how you treat other people. This is how God is transforming the world. If your relationship to the Lord is renewed and restored and refreshed, and revive, you're going to change how you treat those around you. You will become transformed in the Lord. See, there's what we see. Therefore, change what you do unto others. This is the famous golden rule. Change what you do unto others. Now, first of all, I think it's important to note that he's speaking to disciples. He's speaking to those who have believed, those who have received his word. In other words, he's not telling them that this is how you get saved. He doesn't say, now look, if you treat other people the way they treat you, then you'll be saved. That's how you earn your way to heaven. He's not saying that. What he is saying is that as a result of your relationship to the Lord, as a result of your faith and your trust in him, it will change the way you relate how you treat those around you. This is in the Scriptures. In many ways, this is a summary, not just of those few words before it, it's a summary of the entire Sermon on the Mount. Isn't that what he's, If your heart, if the attitudes of your heart are changed, blessed are the poor in spirit. If you have a, a humble heart, the meekness and gentleness of the Lord, will it not change how you relate to those around you? Will it not affect you? Of course. Someone came to the Lord one time and asked, what is the greatest of all commandments? You know the answer. Jesus said, the greatest commandment is this. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind and with all of your strength. Then he continued. This is Matthew chapter 22, verse 39. And the second is like it. Notice how it flows right from one, right into the other. The greatest commandment is this, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then right into that, the second command, the second greatest commandment flows right out of it. It's just like it. He says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. One brings forth the other one. Now John, interestingly, when John was writing, he wrote it in a very strong way. That was very strong. He, he actually said, if a man says that he loves God, but he hates his brother, he's lying. Woo! That's a strong way of saying it. But the point is, right there, love God, and it will change the way you relate to those around you. You know what's interesting? Is that many have suggested that that saying, that golden rule, is not original with Jesus. And it is true that philosophers and others have stated something similar. Hillel, Confucius, Hindu writers, Socrates, Roman Stoics, but they wrote it in the negative. All of them wrote it in the negative, which means this. Whatever you don't want someone to do to you, then you don't do that to them. If you don't want someone stealing your stuff, then you don't steal their stuff. If you don't want someone lying to you, then you don't lie to them. And if you don't want someone treating you bad, then you don't treat them bad. And that's the way that all of them had said it. And then Jesus came and changed it very dramatically. 
Because he said, whatever you want them to do, that is what you also do. Very powerful change there. Very radical. It's very important to understand. This is amazing when you think about what Jesus says here. It not only summarizes, notice what he says in verse 12. Not only does this summarize the entire Sermon on the Mount. Notice verse 12. However you want people to treat you, so treat them. He says, for this is the law and prophets. You know what that says? This summarizes the entire Old Testament. This summarizes all the word of God that they had at the time. The entire word of God can be summarized. The, all the, old, the law and the prophets can be summarized by this one statement. Do you find anything like this in the Old Testament? Sure. Absolutely. Notice in Exodus chapter 23. This is a great verse. Exodus 23 verses 4 and 5. He says, now, if you meet your enemy's ox or donkey wandering away. Now, it, you know, how would we typically react? Let's imagine that we've got some enemy, all right? And we're out there walking on the road or whatever, and we see this ox. And we, we look, is that, is that my enemy's ox? Looks to me like my enemy's ox has wandered away. <laughs> That's kind of a sad thing, isn't it? Oh boy, I wonder how he's going to plow his field in the spring. Woo. That's great. Just made my day. Oh, is that, is that my enemy's donkey wandering away too? Oh, the poor guy. <laughs> yeah, poor thing. Made my day right there. That's my enemy out there after all. You know what? He deserves it, the turkey. Isn't that the way we would react? Isn't that the way a lot of people would react? Here, God in his word says, no, 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 no. This is not the heart I want you to have. This is not the heart. You see your enemy's ox, you go and get that ox and you bring it back to him. Isn't that what you would want? If you had an ox and it got, you need that ox. That's a valuable, valuable thing to your, uh, your, your farm. If your enemy sees your ox wandering away, what is it that you want your enemy to do? You would like your enemy to go get that ox and you bring it back. If your enemy sees your donkey running off loose, what do you want your enemy to do? You want your enemy to be nice. If you do something nice, can you just grab, put it away for a while, get the ox or the donkey, bring it back. He says, well, that's what I want you to do. If you see, notice what he says, if you see the donkey of the one who hates you lying helpless under its load, you shall refrain from leaving it to him. Release it with him. You help. You get under there and you help get that donkey on its feet. Why should I do that? He hates me. Because I asked you to, that's why. Because it's the heart of those who follow me. Why should we do this? Maybe we should do this in order to get others to do You know, if I do good to them, maybe they'll do good to me. Is that why I should do it? Does it do it because I ask you to do it? It's, your, it's, it's a result of your relationship to God because He has changed your heart, because it fulfills the entire Word of God, because it represents the heart of God. Doesn't God do the same? God causes the sun to shine on the righteous and the unrighteous. God causes the rain, that's blessing, that brings crops. God causes the rain to fall on the good as well as the evil. That's the heart of the Lord. Now, going back to Matthew chapter 7, notice something, it's very interesting. However you want people to treat you, so treat them. That one sentence has transforming power. Imagine, if you would, if we actually did that. What happens, what would happen if everyone actually did that verse? It would transform the world. Imagine if, how powerful that one sentence is. One sentence, just one verse in the Bible can transform the world. Imagine if everyone did that right there. There would be no more crime or murder or hatred, or robbery, or assault, or road rage. There would be no more adultery, or a divorce, or child abuse, or oppression, or jealousy, 
or envy or anger or starvation or church splits or conflicts of any kind. That one verse has the power to change. You know, you look at that verse, and I think all of us would say, we agree with this verse. Amen? We agree with this verse. We admire this verse. But the question is this, do you take it seriously? We want God to take our prayers seriously. We want God to hear our prayers and to hear our word and to take our word seriously. And God looks at us and would say, but do you take my word seriously? I've asked you to treat others the way you would have them treat you. Would you do that, please? And you will find that it represents the heart of God. Do that because God has changed you. Do that because he's transforming you. Do that because it represents his heart to the world. And then he says, notice what comes next. Because in verse 13, what he then follows is with a challenge. Because what he then says is, now there are two gates and there are two paths. That's what he says. There are two gates, there are two paths, and only two. Choose. Choose the way you're going to live your life. That's what he's saying. You've heard these words, now make a choice. How are you going to live? Notice verse 13. Enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction and many are those who enter by it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life and few are those who find it. When you look at this, he's giving a Hebrew picture for us of a shepherd and a sheep. Of course, because a shepherd would bring his sheep into a pen. A, a, a pen in which they could be protected as they slept. And he would be there staying with them, giving them uh, uh, comfort, but also security. And he would be with them. But then in the morning, he would come and he would open a way, a gate, into the pen or out of the pen. And there he would open it right into a path that would lead them into green pastures or whatever. And so Jesus gives a picture that they would understand. And what is he saying? He's saying that Jesus is that path. Jesus is that way. Jesus is the gate that leads to life. There are two ways and only two. Choose. There are two gates and only two. Choose. This is the word that Jesus gave. Now, there are other scriptures that give us great insight. Would you turn in your Bibles to John chapter 10? Look at John 10. As he says this in a, a little different but very powerful way. John 10, beginning in verse 7. Jesus therefore said to them again, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, and the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. You can imagine him standing at the gate, right? I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he shall be saved. And he shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. There is this beautiful picture. Jesus is that door. Jesus is that shepherd. Jesus is the gate. Jesus is the path. All of these pictures for us are beautiful and challenge us to choose. Notice also in John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way, I am the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. That's the narrow way. The narrow gate. Few are those that find it. This statement runs counter to our culture today. Don't you agree? That's very counter to our culture. Our culture today is very uh, uh, broad. They want to reward broadness, you know, all inclusive. Now, open to all. There are many ways, many roads. You can choose any road you want. Let's be all, let's not be narrow now. Let's be all open. I have a question. Is there a God? Yes, there is. Does God reveal himself? Yes, he does. How does God reveal himself? Scripture tells us in Romans chapter 1 that he reveals himself through nature. But does he also reveal himself in other ways? Yes, Hebrews chapter 1 tells us 
that in the older days, God revealed himself through prophets. But these days, he reveals himself through his son. God sent his son to reveal his way. All other ways are man's ways. Jesus came from the Father and he said, there is only one way if you want to go to God. Oh, that's very narrow. That's very narrow-minded there, Pastor. Well, you can explain that to God when you meet him in heaven. He came up with a plan for redemption that that son would die on the cross to pay the penalty for our sin. And there is this beautiful picture for us. And these words, we enter into the kingdom. Notice what he says, verse 15. Beware of false prophets. Beware. There are those who would lead you astray. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing. They look like sheep, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. And you will know them by their fruit. They don't speak words of life. If they speak the words of life, they would speak Jesus' words of life. No, they're in the ravenous wolves. How can you tell a ravenous wolf? Well, if you've got a bunch of sheep, typically those sheep are going to be eating grass. That's, that's the Word of God. They're feeding, they're nurturing, they're, they're feeding on the Word of God. There are others who are not feeding on grass. They're feeding on other sheep. That's a dead giveaway. Pardon the pun. And he says, beware of ravenous wolves, false prophets. For what you need is the way, the truth, and the life. You'll know them by their fruits. And then he said, after giving that great caution, Verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Now, some people, when they look at that, they make that a statement of the law. They say, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will. What is the will? Some people will say, well, and they start giving us the commandments of the law. Do not steal. Do not lie. Do not dishonor your parents. Do not do this. Do not. That's the will of God. And which is true. That is the will of God. But they left out something very important there, didn't they? The will of God is when we recognize that he sent his son to pay the penalty for all of our sin. For all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The will of the Father is when we admit it, when we recognize it, when we receive the forgiveness based upon the blood of Jesus Christ. And then we enter into the kingdom of heaven. There is the will of the Father. God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son that whosoever believes will have everlasting life. Amen? Lastly, Notice verse 24. These words are a strong foundation. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts upon them, when you build upon them, build your life upon them, he may be compared to a wise man who built his house upon the rock. The rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew, burst against that house, and yet it did not fall, for it had been founded upon the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act upon them will be like a foolish man who built his house upon the sand. The rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew, and he burst against that house, but it fell. And oh, how great was its fall. Jesus is giving great words here. He said these, these words, this sermon that he gave, foundational. And you build your life on these words, and your life will sustain the troubles the tribulations, the difficulties that this life will bring. They are a foundation on which to build. Everyone is building something. Everyone is building something in their lives. Jesus said, you build on these words and you're building on a solid foundation. I love how it finished. Verse 28, the result was that when Jesus had finished these words, the multitudes were amazed. 
literally in awe of his teaching, for he was teaching them as one having authority, not like their scribes. Does he have authority in your life? When Jesus speaks, does he speak with authority so that you would say, Lord, when you speak, I'm going to change. When you speak, I'm going to listen. I'm going to build my life upon those words. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the encouragement from your word that we should ask and keep asking and seek and keep seeking and knocking and keep knocking. For you speak of our relationship to the Lord to trust that you're doing that which is good. We can trust your timing. We can trust your heart. We can trust that you would take our prayers seriously. Lord, would you change our lives? Would you transform us? Help us to change how we treat the others. Lord, I pray that we would see that your way is the way to life. And so I pray this morning, O oh Father, as we come as a church before you, that we would decide that we will build our lives upon these words. We will seek the transformation that comes when we build our lives upon these words. We commit our lives to being transformed. We commit our lives to being transformed. Do you agree? Would you say amen to that? We commit our lives to being transformed. Oh God in heaven, hear our heart. Your words are a lamp to our feet. They're a foundation for our lives. We honor you, we love you, and thank you for all that you're doing in us today. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, we're going to worship the Lord. On behalf of Calvary Chapel Worship Center and Pastor Rich Jones, we thank you for ordering this message. Our prayer is that God will use it in your life to increase your knowledge and your love for Him. If we may serve you in any way, please contact our church office at 503-642-2003 or on our website at www.calvaryhillsboro.org. On behalf of all of us at Calvary Chapel Worship Center and Pastor Rich Jones, May God bless you.